Happy Hanukkah, Hanukkah Sameach, Afrelechen Hanukkah. Welcome to the HCSS first night Hanukkah celebrations. Tonight, we will begin with the lighting of the menorah with Chazan Avrami, which will be followed by a conversation around hope. What is hope? Hope, according to the Cambridge Dictionary, is to want something to happen or to be true, and usually have a good reason to think that it might be. It's not tangible, it's a dream. However, tonight, we will find out how to make hope tangible. In the beginning of this week, we commemorated the Shloshim, the 30 days of mourning of Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, where Chief Rabbi Mervis spoke about how Rabbi Sachs emulated hope, tikvat tova. He gave hope and taught others to bring hope. And why in our holidays, in our high hol holy days prayers, do we say tikvat tova, good hope? Is there bad hope? Rabbi Mervis explains that if hope is completely reliant on Hashem, on God, like we completely give ourselves and say, okay, we're gonna hope for the best, then it's insufficient. We need to make efforts in order to have good hope. And that's what Rabbi Sachs had, tikva tova, hope that was filled with bitachon, with faith in the Almighty, accompanied with effort with his tremendous work spreading globally. Let's hope tonight we will be an evening of Tikva Tova, where we have faith in the Almighty along with our efforts in understanding what hope is and that the Hanukkah lights will lift our spirits and get us through this pandemic. We will now light the menorah with Chazan Avrami, joined by Professor Korn in Israel, which Rabbi Sachs referred to as the home of hope. Chazan Avrami. Hi everyone and Hanukkah Sameach. Happy Hanukkah to you all. So exciting to be lighting the first light of Hanukkah tonight. Great to have you with us. It's going to be an exciting hour, an inspirational hour, an uplifting hour, and I'm excited to be with you lighting the Hanukkah candles. I see uh, we are being joined at simultaneously by Professor Korn and his lovely wife and his family in Yerushalayim. So it's even more special that we're lighting simultaneously at exactly the same time here in London and you in Yerushalayim. Here we go. Three brachot tonight, of course, being the first night of Hanukkah. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kedishanu B'mitzvosam V'asivonu L'had Likaner Shehelech Hanukkah Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam She'asam Nisim Elav Oseinu Bayamim Ahaheim Pazman Hazem Baruch Shekhe yondu, 
So I have lit my menorah and as is tradition we sing Ma Oz Sur. Join in with me please. Let's crank up the rhythm a little bit. Get your dancing shoes on. Oh, dreidel, 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 I made you out of clay. 
And when you're dry and ready, your dreidel I will play. Hi, ya la 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 la, ya la 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 la. Hi, ya 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 ya. Seventeen bun, so so. Hanukkah, ahu hatta. You know this one. Divan zu asa. Hanukkah, ahu hatta. Now, the best part of Hanukkah is having a donut and having a latke at least. Here comes in my hand a donut. Wow, thank you so much. Here we go. We live in hope that they're good. I'm sure they're good. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Boirei Mi Name Is Zonas. Perfection, perfection on a plate, I should say. Absolutely delicious. Don't go because I need to taste a latka, one of Rachel's latkas that she's made. Let me put this down. Put this here. Here we go. Here's one I prepared earlier. Look at that. They're looking amazing. Yum. Wow. Here we go. I never mind being the sampler, the tester. Quality control. Mm-hmm. Amazing! Well done, really good. I don't know what you were so worried about. It's delicious. Absolutely delicious. Back to you at the studio. I'll see you in one minute. I've got to finish these and all these. Thank you, Chazan Avrami. You know, you always know how to lift the spirits and give so much hope to us all, um, especially showing us how to eat a donut and those delicious latkes. I hope you're going to share some to me and to others who are watching. So it is now my honor to introduce Professor Korn. Dr. Korn earned his BA and MD degrees from Boston University and completed his postgraduate training at the University of Pennsylvania. As a professor of oncology for close to 25 years, Ben is known as one of the leading lecturers in the scientific community. The author of over 200 publications where he enlightens us with the science of hope. Interestingly enough, though, the study came about from individuals who were going through everyday challenges. And once they saw how successful the hope theory worked on everyday happenstance, they brought it to the oncology department. And through LifeStore, the organization he founded with his, with his wife, Devora, and in collaboration with international academic partners, Ben is leading research efforts to unravel the mysteries and mechanism of hope on the behavioral and neuroscientific levels, including the training of medical professionals and patients in the hope enhancement model. Rabbi Friedman and Chazan Avrami, who I hope is finished eating, will be in conversation with Professor Korn about this amazing discovery, followed by Q&A. Over to you. Chag Sameach, everybody, and Chazan Avrami. Wow, that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, wish you were, wish we were there with you. Sorry, I was on mute. Apologies. I said, Rabbi Friedman, I'm going to save you a latke and a donut. Oh, you are the best. You are the best. I always know how to please Chazan Avrami. Well, it's, it's such a, a privilege and an honor to be hosting Professor Korn this evening, live from Jerusalem, and an honor to be having the conversation alongside my dear colleague, Chazan Avrami. And so, Professor Korn, let's turn it over to you. How do you define hope? 
Um, first of all, I just want to say it's an amazing opportunity and a privilege to be with you, um, with this community who I think by definition is so unique for um, considering a program like this and some of the ideas that we have percolating. Um, I want to thank all the organizers that have already spoken. I also want to thank two people be behind the scenes, uh, Madeline Black and uh, Deborah Korn, um, who have really helped raise this up. So I'm here um, with um, uh, all of you from Jerusalem, where our dreidels say, Nes Gadol Hayap Po, um, and it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling to connect uh, with our brothers and sisters um, uh, in the UK. Uh, one of the things that really interests me about hope is that in the past, you know, I'm, my training is as a, a physician who takes care of people with cancer. Um, and we all want hope. The physicians want hope and the patients want hope. Everybody's for that. It's kind of, there's, there's the American humorist, uh, Mark Twain spoke about the weather and he said, you know, everybody's talking about the weather, but no one's doing, doing anything about it. And it's kind of the same thing with hope. We're all speaking about it, we all want it, but, but really what is this thing called hope? And um, about 30 years ago, there was a professor named Rick Snyder who said, I have an idea. I want to interview people uh, who I consider to be very hopeful and understand what it is that makes them that way. Now, um, I don't know, um, uh, Edward, if you have um, those slides, those, those build slides, um, but if you do, maybe we can look at um, build one. If you don't, no problem. Okay, so this professor said there are really three components to hopefulness. One is that you need to have a goal. Um, as Bhatia implied, hope is about a future orientation. We're looking ahead. And you have to have a goal to aspire to. But it's not just enough to have a goal. That goal has to be plausible. If it's a goal like I want to win you know, the lottery tomorrow, well, I kind of hope that that should happen, but that's not really something I can bring about, which is one of the keys about hope that I want to get to in a moment. Do you have the next build slide, um, Edward? So. This is, um, for those who don't know, Danny Avdia. And Danny Avdia just got a $4 million contract to play basketball in the United States. He's only the second Israeli to ever get uh, such a contract. Um, and my whole life, I've essentially had the goal of also getting a $4 million contract to play basketball in America. Um, and in many ways, I still have that goal. But the problem is, it is not a plausible goal. It's just not going to happen. So this also would not be a hopeful way of thinking. I have to choose a goal that I really can bring about. So the first of the three issues is a goal. On the next um, build, um, we have the second element, which is a pathway. I have to think about how I might get to my goal. Now, I do this understanding as an adult that the pathways are usually not as straight as the one I've drawn in that picture. Usually they twist and they turn and they have obstacles and they have pitfalls. The hopeful person knows how to keep his or her mind on that goal, recognizing that it might not be so easy to get there, that I might have to think really hard about how to circumvent the obstacles that are put in front of me, or maybe the internal obstacles that I have. Maybe I have you know, some, as we would say, midot, some, some features, some traits in my personality, jealousy, anger, impatience, those are also obstacles. So the external obstacles that are out there, um, we try to circumvent. As far as the internal obstacles go, the ones within me, I believe we have to dance with them. And we can speak more about that later. The final element besides the goal and the pathway is on this last slide, and that is called agency. Agency is kind of the motivation, the drive to set out on that pathway. Um, if you're not really inspired to seek the goal, then the goal and the pathway won't help you that much. So it's very important that aside from setting goals and figuring out how to get there, 
that we want to get there. Some of you might know the um, story, the children's book, The Little Engine That Could. That's the little choo-choo train that's constantly looking at the mountains that are in front of her. And she's saying, I know I can, I know I can, I can get there. And that's kind of the drive, the motivation, the agency that we're talking about. So that is most of the definition of hopefulness that I would like to adopt with you. And I wanted to say one more thing um, before we make this a conversation again, which is what we really want. And that is, I want to distinguish between two words, hope, and optimism. Often we think of those words as synonyms, as one and the same, but they're really not. The difference is as follows. When you think of the classic metaphor of the glass half empty, that is really the image that pertains to the optimist. In fact, the optimist doesn't just see the glass half full, if you will, the optimist sees the glass um, half full with, with Luca's aid, with something really, really sweet. Um, these are people who kind of put a smiley sticker on everything in their lives. Some would call it pathological optimism. Everyone would call it congenital optimism. You either have it or you don't. I can't teach that. Hope, on the other hand, as we'll develop this evening, is something that over 90% of us can learn to do. It's a skill based on the three building blocks that we just mentioned. Okay, I find that absolutely fascinating. And can I say from the outset, from the outset, Professor, that when I read, I did, I've done my homework on you, by the way, I've done my homework on you, and uh, I can't wait to get out to Israel because you will be one of my first visits, if you allow me, um, because I, 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 I was fascinated You're to- welcome. I was fascinated to read your story. Uh, for those that don't know, um, Professor lost his father at a very, very young age uh, of 11. Is that correct? That's right. And uh, when, uh, to cut a very long story short, when they broke the news to you about your father's passing, you felt at that point that you were so, you felt so let down by the terminology and by the uh, coldness of the doctor relating to you the news of your father's passing, that at that point in your life, as an 11 year old child, you decided I'm gonna become a doctor and I am going to change the terminology uh, of the, the way doctors talk to patients and their families. Is that, is that, is that in a nutshell what you said? Yeah, up? yeah okay. I, I, if, if I can, first of all, I appreciate your bringing that up. Um, and really, it was a treat to listen to you. I, it was just so uplifting, I, I gotta say. Um, no, really. Um, so that is true, but there's a little um, piece in the middle. When, when my dad um, passed away from prostate cancer, first of all, it was a very traumatic evening. It was on, it was on Pesach, and uh, the young physician who called us, uh, basically, as you suggest, used harsh terminology he said, Mrs. Korn, when he was speaking to my mother, your husband has expired. And when I think back at that, first of all, I've never heard anybody else use that term. Um, it's almost like to say that, you know, the cottage cheese uh, can no longer be consumed because we've passed our expiration date. And then there was a pause and he said, can we perform an autopsy? Now, I'm setting aside even the whole issue uh, that religious Jews like myself might have about an autopsy, but just to immediately, as a follow-on question, bring that up, it was, it was just outrageous. I thought um, I was going to medical school to find a cure for prostate cancer. But when I arrived in medical school about seven or eight years later, I also experienced a very harsh interaction between a world-renowned university professor in terms of how she broke the news to a family. And at that moment, I said, nothing has changed. We have a problem. And that's when it just became a fire within me um, that, uh, that was my passion, to deal with this issue of communication and to find a way to help others, even in these dire times, um, See the hope. So, so, so sorry, Robert Friedman. 
No, no, I was just going to say that I think that uh, really what your work takes to the next level is to say that it's not just the bedside manner of the oncologist at end of life that's important or beyond end of life, but already from the beginning of the story, there is, you know, once that relationship begins, what you have now brought to your field is to be able to say, well, it's not just every extra day or year that I can uh, keep this person alive, it's what's going on during that time. Chief Rabbi said the other day, the difference between saying Chaim Aruchim and Arichot Yamim. There's long life and then there's length of days. Each day, that needs to be meaningful. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and I think we really do have to front load it. I think um, in many ways, um, this model for hopefulness began outside the medical world. It's only been recently by myself and some other co dear colleagues been imported into the medical world. It started making students more hopeful, making people who might have lost their jobs, um, athletes, prisoners, you name it. No one was really looking at it from the medical lens. And lately we've been working on it, but the inspiring part for me, and I'm sure this can be a piece of our conversation tonight, is that we can easily bring this back out to healthy people in the community. I think everybody really does want hope. And I think as you're suggesting, the more we um, find a way to make this normative, to make this part of our common parlance, the more we can express our care and our concern for each other. Because if I have a dear friend who might be struggling with something or is a little bit down, um, if I want to get to know my children better, um, I think a lot of it comes down to understanding what their goals might be, especially the important and meaningful goals that can connect to the core values of the individual. Once I know more about that human being, what makes him or her tick, then I believe as a concerned person, I can help that person begin to connect values and goals. And this is one of the things I'm so excited about um, to be working with, with your kahila. Um, and to see what we can what we can do about that, Professor. Do you hand on heart, honestly think? And 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 I'm throwing this question at you with all sincerity. And I'm talking actually from personal experience. I've been very very sick years ago, and I was in hospital, and I received wonderful wonderful care from doctors and from nurses and from family support, etc. But I did get the feeling at the time that there were doctors that healed and were interested in the medical side of things. And there were doctors that had a softer touch and would say a few personal words to me and, and, and show a little bit of warmth to me at the same time. And at the time I thought, this doctor has a, a social uh, etiquette and this doctor doesn't. But I do remember um, many years ago, there was a, an article in the Times that spoke about the fact that modern day doctors wear their stethoscopes around their neck in a rather cool way like that, instead of the old fashioned way where they used to have them like that, if you know what I mean, where they could just pick them up and put them in their ears. And the argument was that it takes about two seconds longer to take the stethoscope off your shoulder from the cool position to put in your ears rather than put it straight in your ear. And they added up all those two seconds from all the thousands of doctors around the country. And they said, just to be cool, we're wasting so much medical time. And so my question to you, Professor, is don't you feel more and more in today's medical world that we're so short of, um, we're so short of expertise and that we're so short of, of doctors and of good doctors that they themselves feel, I need to take care of the medical side of things. For the other side of things and for the care and for the warmth and the support and the love, we've got counselors and we've got clergy people going around the hospital and we've got therapists going around the hospital and they'll take care of that. I need to take care of the medical aspect of that. What would you say to them? Right, okay, that's a great question and thank you for it. Um, first of all, I just wanna make a comment about stethoscopes. And not, not, not to say that they're being replaced by our smartphones, which they are. So all this coolness controversy is gonna go away. 
But I think the most important aspect of the stethoscope, you know, stethoscopes, you can buy them today for um, a few dollars or pounds or hundreds of dollars or pounds. Um, but the most important feature of the stethoscope is actually the part that goes in between the earpieces. It's the neshama that has to process the information, deal with it, and then relate it back um, to the individual. That's really the, the art of medicine. But you bring up an important question because absolutely, um, it's not enough for me just to be this quote, caring person, this, you know, do good Nick, I have to have expertise and that takes time and that takes training. Well, I wanna say something. There's another dimension which we don't think about and that is what's in it for the physician. The physician is also a stakeholder here. And part of my job, because of your question, is to convince the patient that aside from the moral aspect of what he or she, the doctor needs to be doing for the patients they treat, part of my job is to tell the professional that there's something here for him or for her. In my field, oncology, when we treat patients with cancer and try and help their caregivers, their family members, there is a very, very high burnout rate that approaches about 50%. About half of us are just ready to hang it up, to just stop because it's too demanding. There's burnout and there's another phenomenon called, phenomenon called compassion fatigue. One of the things, and in fact, it's even more than that, uh, among that 50% or so that are burning out, probably about a quarter of them, this is a scary statistic I'm gonna give you right now, a quarter of them have at some point had suicidal ideation, have said, this is just not worth it. I can't go on like this. And this relates to the fact that for many of us, career is, is so defining. But we have, in our research, been trying to enhance hopefulness, not only among patients and caregivers, we've been doing it among physicians. And one of the things I didn't mention to you before is that hope is not only something we can now define, as opposed to this abstract concept or the lovely dictionary definitions that uh, Bhakti read to us, we can really define it and we can measure it. And what's more, we can impact that hopefulness has on other dimensions in our life, including burnout. And there are several tools for measuring burnout. One of them is called the MBI or the Maslach Burnout Index. And we've already shown that hope seems to be an antidote for burnout. So for us in the medical world, this has become almost an elixir, um, almost something that I'm now telling my colleagues you need to be able to keep going on. And that makes them very interested in it. Not just because they want to do something for their patients, because they know there's something in it for them. And that's nothing to be ashamed of. I think that's very human. So, Professor Kwan, give us a little more of the nuts and bolts of the science of hope and your own particular hope to mize. What does that look like? And spell it out for us, please. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, um, another barrier that we've had in introducing this concept to colleagues in the medical profession is because hope itself not only feels too abstract, it doesn't feel scientific. And I will use a term, it feels sort of icky. It feels almost like what I, as a graduate of a medical school, a reputable medical school, don't want to be involved with. I want molecular biology and I want new pharmaceutical agents and I want to be speaking to Glaxo and AstraZeneca about my ideas. But it turns out there is a science of hope. And there's a science of hope, first of all, if you listen to what I was saying before, you understood that hope is a skill that I can acquire, which is cognitive. That is, I can activate something in here that can make me more hopeful. And we've been studying this with grants from the National Cancer Institute in the United States. There are some candidates, not political candidates, 
but there are some areas in our brain which seem to be most involved in the hopefulness pathway. One of them is called the hippocampus. Hippocampus is a Greek word um, for seahorse because the ancient anatomists, many of them living in, in Greece, thought in fact that this structure resembled uh, a seahorse. I think it looks a little bit more like a sausage, but, um, but they thought it looked like a seahorse. I, wanted to, I just wanted to take 10 seconds to tell you a story because it happened exactly at this time about five years ago. Um, Dvara and I are grandparents and we're, this is an international project. Um, you will be the first community that we're working with, but we've been invited by many um, scientific centers around the world to lecture and to do workshop training. The first one was in Greece, and it happened at the University of Athens about five years ago, this time of year. So we live in Jerusalem. The airport is in a suburb of, Te of Tel Aviv in Lod, as many of you know. And we, I was on my way to the airport, and I passed through Modi'in, which is where my daughter and grandchild was living. The grandchild was then in the Gan, in the kindergarten uh, of an Israeli school. And um, it was Hanukkah time. And I was on my way to the airport. He goes, where are you going, you know, Saba? And I said, oh, I'm going to Athens. And he said, you're going to the Greeks? Anyway, that was just a Hanukkah story. So the bottom line is that it seems to us that there are these many um, structures in the brain which could be involved with hopefulness. And one of our tricks is to try and activate those different structures. Now, what we've been doing with this hope technique, which is a term that we've kind of coined, it's a contraction of two words, of hope and optimize. In other words, we believe that one can use hopefulness tools and the hopeful way of thinking to make many dimensions of life better. And the way we've been going about this is really to create, and we have a colleague um, in California that we've worked with very closely. He's sort of a disciple of the professor I mentioned before. His name is David Feldman. And we've been working uh, with him to develop a very brief workshop in less than two hours, probably even 90 minutes, we believe we can change the lives by changing the way of thinking of the people who are interested in learning these techniques. And we believe this because we've been collecting the data and we've published the data in several ways. And now, and this is almost one of the upsides of this ironic period that we're in, COVID times. And I was thinking about it as I was listening to your beautiful Shekhi and as I was kind of clapping and dancing with you. Shekhi was about time. It's about hazman hazed, this moment. And in life, we as adults know that there aren't just highs. There are some pretty low lows that we also have to deal with. Now, COVID has presented a lot of challenges for everyone in our orbit, but there are also some upsides to it. Um, I don't think we'd be sitting you know, thanks to the wonderful work of, of Edward, who has enabled this, and I didn't mention Catherine before, I don't think we'd be sitting here together in this format unless we all got so comfortable in the last eight or nine months doing this, reaching out and interacting uh, with each other. So one of the things we've now done is instead of having a workshop where we sit together in a comfortable room, which is wonderful, we've now found a way to do this on a virtual platform. What's more, one of the challenges in the hope research is not just to get a spike of hopefulness, but rather to maintain that level of hopefulness. And we've now been developing a smartphone, a mobile application um, exactly for this purpose, which can allow us to stay connected with people and to allow individuals to further enhance their hopefulness and to share that with others. So, Professor, what would you say to a question like, do you not believe that people either have it or don't have it? And you, and a social grace-like uh, care and, and this type of empathy that doctors need to show patients and their families, you've either got it or you don't have it. It's not something that you can learn. Would you disagree with that then? 
Okay, I, I agree with part of that, and I disagree with uh, I respectfully disagree with other parts. Um, I do believe there are certain people that are endowed with compassion and just have more empathy than, uh, let's say, the median level of empathy. If we could graph it in a population, there's no question about it. You know, we we see these people, we know these people. There are people that were more comfortable being around, people that were less comfortable being around. Having said that. I also believe that almost everyone can become more hopeful and more empathic. And I say that, by the way, for again, let's say it's a bell curve. I say that mostly because I'm concerned with the people that aren't endowed with huge repositories of empathy. Um, but I even say it for the people on the end of the spectrum where someone like you in these conversations I've had the privilege of having with you over I'm in with Rabbi. Um, you have it, and I think actually, once you participate in some of these workshops, and I know you're going to, we can even give someone like you more empathy and more hope. I actually believe that because I've seen it. Um, one of the big questions then is, let's take the people who are more organically empathic, more organically hopeful. They have a certain advantage, but can I get others to similar levels? I call this a hope phenotype. Just like, you know, can I, my eyes are blue. I don't know if you can see that right now. But <laughs> the idea is, can I get, and I can't really see what your, <laughs> what your color, what color are your eyes? Can I get you to have a phenotype of hopefulness that really resembles whatever ideal we're shooting for? Now that's something we have to study. Um, I'm a scientist. I, I like measuring and I like studying. And I think we can do that. And, um, We'll see. I think we can do that on a communal level as well. In the hospital environment, of course, we get informed consent. We uh, ask ethics committees to review our ideas. Um, but I think as we uh, you know, pair off and break down to smaller groups in your lovely community, um, I believe these groups and subgroups will also find that they can nourish each other and almost spiral upwards with hopefulness. That's what I envision. How does that look then practically? And are we talking Zoom conversations? What, what do these workshops look like? Yeah, so what we would be proposing is, uh, depending on what the response is, um, probably having some groups that have you know, mutual interests, maybe some young adults, um, maybe some young marrieds with families, maybe some medical experts. Um, and at the outset, um, offering workshops in a platform like Zoom, where uh, perhaps myself and Dvora would be leading. We'd give a little bit of um, teaching about some of these elements, a bit of the stuff I talked about before, maybe a few other little uh, teaching pearls. And then we use something called the HOPE map and really something called the HOPE prescription. Let me just take a moment to speak about that. I, I had some slides, but we're going to skip the slides. We had, I, I do want to show a few other slides at the very end, but um, the idea is, as noble as this idea is, that we can select a goal, if I asked most of the people that are on this uh, conversation right now to write in their goal to the chat, it turns out only about 20% of the people right now could come up with a goal. So one of the things we do in this workshop is we give you categories. We say, perhaps you want a domain um, in the professional world. Like maybe I want another degree. Maybe I want to have a goal of moving towards another type of a career. That might be one. Um, you might have another goal in the family world. Maybe there's a relative who I'm not speaking to uh, the way I used to speak to that person. Maybe that could be my goal to repair and rekindle that relationship. We do that, and then once we've selected a goal that's meaningful, we use the map to actually think about the goal and chart a path to get to that goal and deal with the obstacles. I don't wanna um, give away all of the secrets in the recipe right now, but it's a tremendously um, valuable and enlightening program. And why, why, and why would you say that it's so important for the for the doctor to be involved in something like goal setting as opposed to 
other members of the team so that he can go on to the next patient in the next bedroom and, and, and use his time perhaps more wisely. Why would you say it's so important for him to be involved in, in, in things like goal setting and understanding what your dreams are for end of life, for example? Right. Okay. So two, two things. First of all, um, and this is almost uh, paradoxical, but it's true. And we have the data. Once a physician learns these techniques, he or she actually becomes a more efficient communicator. They actually save time because once you internalize this process, it becomes rather uh, streamlined. And more importantly, in answer to your question, it's critical because I, as a physician, am trained in a certain model. I want to cure. But in my world, not every type of cancer that I confront is curable. And so it's very important for me to know that the time comes when my reflex of, as I like to say, taking just another drug off the shelf might not be the right thing to do. It might be that the toxicity related to a therapy is just not worth it for the patient. Now, some patients want to fight and they always want the next therapy and the most innovative thing. But some patients don't want that. And it's wrong to push that on the patient. Now, unfortunately, the way physicians are trained even today is within a biomedical model to just keep pressing on and trying to push the science forward. But very often, if we take the time to listen to our patients, we see that we're not in sync with them. We're not aligned with them. If in fact, that is our agenda. We have to have the goal of the patient somehow coincide with the goal of the medical community. And that's a very important shidduch that we have to learn how to, how to bring about. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you answered that question absolutely beautifully. And, and I couldn't get it until you just answered me now. By understanding, by understanding the patient in their world and, and their world, and by understanding the patient and their desires and the family, you will be saving time type of thing. You will Absolutely. be saving time. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, you answered that beautifully. Thank you for that. You've explained that very well indeed. And I can see your blue eyes. <laughs> um, I don't know how much time we have left. I wanted to actually show just a few more slides. Would that be okay uh, right now? Because I think it relates to part of what we can be doing as a community. Um, so would that be okay, uh, Rabbi and Hazan Rami? Absolutely. We're used, to, we're used to that from our government uh, broadcast. Next slide, please. Next okay. slide. Okay, so next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so this is a painting by the Dutch master Peter Bruegel. And I know there's going to be somebody writing in the chat, but I didn't pronounce that correctly, so I apologize. Um, it's called The Fall of Icarus. And um, we all know the story from Greek mythology that Icarus was this young lad who had this, uh, he had a lot of hubris, hubris, you know, he wanted to be able to fly and reach the gods in the sky. And uh, he didn't have a lot of seichel though, because he made these wings with his dad and he fastened the wings together with wax. And as he got very close to the sun, well, the wax melted and he plummeted into the sea. So if you look at the next slide, you can see that what the artist is doing is he's kind of winking at us and smiling at us because that's the splashdown. It's kind of like a where's Wally uh, type, of, um, type of game. You know, that's Icarus right there falling into the sea. Okay, but in the next slide, you see something else. In the next slide, you see a farmer, okay, and he is tilling the land. And in the next slide, you see a shepherd who is tending to his flock. And in the last slide that I'll show you, you see a fisherman. 
Now, these people are right there and Icarus is drowning. And actually the artist was not only trying to laugh a little bit by placing Icarus in that splashdown position, the artist was making a social commentary. The artist was saying in the painting that's actually called the landscape of the fall of Icarus, that we have a problem, that many of us are very close to someone who is suffering or someone who is in trouble, and we're going about our business, we're not doing anything. Now, because it's Hanukkah, I want to take my dreidel and spin it in another direction. I want to give another interpretation. I want to say that maybe what was going on is not that these people didn't care, maybe they didn't have the tools to express caring. Because I wanna say that in our, in our own experiences, we all at some point know that we've seen a neighbor or a relative who had fallen upon bad times and we almost ignore it because we don't think we have something for them. One of the things that I believe is very, very exciting about the hope tool that Dvorah and I want to share with you, because it's a gift that we want to, it's a Hanukkah gift. We want, to, we want to share that with you, is that it will give you a very simple but effective way to reach out to someone. Imagine if we taught you to really recognize what it is that's important to another person and how we can reach those goals and how we can deal with obstacles in the way. I think this would be a tremendous, tremendous value. And I want to, at the risk of sounding a little bit um, you know, corny, as we say in America, I want to say that um, this year, as we watch the wax melt in our Hanukkah candles, I'd like you to think about the wax of Icarus's wings melting and to see hope in that opportunity as we're describing it now. Dr. Kwan. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can just end off uh, before we go back to Rabbi Nebatya and and Chazam uh, I think is is concluding the program. Uh, we've spoken a lot about your particular field of oncology, but this is you're bringing this hope to to our community to various different groups. Could you summarize in in just a sentence or two what we can expect as different demographics, uh, dealing with different challenges, how hope to mize, uh, applies to our uh, issues? Okay, great question. Um, what I really think this is about, first of all, is taking a broad view of zooming out on what we mean by community. And I think what you'll find is that hope, and I know this is a very dangerous word to use in COVID times, but hope and hopefulness are almost infectious. I think once people begin to learn it and how to do it, they will be spreading this message and it will become part of who they are. And I believe you will feel almost this blanket of caring that is surrounding your community. And I think that people will take it outside of the boundaries of some of these workshops that we're doing, because all boundaries are artificial. And I can imagine that let's say we do a workshop with um, young professionals. I can imagine that once they leave the workshop, they will go into their work environment the next day. And maybe somebody who's a manager will speak to an employee and help that employee. I think I, I would envision them together defining goals and figuring out ways to um, measure the effectiveness of reaching those goals in the work environment. And then that would, cycle back on itself and people would feel very motivated, have the agency that we talked about to pursue those goals. So I think what you'll find is there's almost this frenzy. Once people buy in to this idea of hopefulness, they really try to make it part of their routine. I wasn't kidding when I said it'll change. It's, it's a game changer. It changes the way the culture feels and it changes the way we think. And you'll feel it very, very organically in in your worldview. Um, this is very experiential. It's very hard to define. It's almost like telling somebody, you know, what Shabbos is. And until you're there and experiencing Shabbos, you, you really don't know what it is. You can't just write about it. And I think it's very much this, or, or something like um, having a child. I could try to be as, as empathetic as I am, but my wife was the one who had the four daughters. I, what did I have to do with it? 
I mean, a little bit. But um, I think it's the same thing with hope. I think you have to be there with us. And I really want to encourage people to sign up to these workshops, which God willing will be launching in January. And we are so looking forward to this opportunity to make your community with you a community of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cohn. Corn, thank you. You really brought you know the science and the art together, and we really appreciate everybody joining us this evening. And you know, many many see, especially the international community is watching, tuning in. No Chazan Avrami as the Chazan, but you know, many of us know in town that he does more than that. He does a lot of the pastoral care, and this is this is a great was a great opportunity. We were very blessed to have him be part of this conversation. So thank you, Chazan Avrami and Rabbi Friedman. Uh, for your insights and, and your questions to uh, Professor Korn to be able to enlighten us with the science of hope. And, you know, you spoke, you, you started off with optimism versus hope. And as though, I want to end off with the late Rabbi Sachs, how he defines it. He says, optimism is the belief that things will get better. Hope is the belief that together we can make things better. And so we hope that the community comes together and take on these workshops. And so if anybody here wants further information on how to have hope together, please look out for the details. We'll be sending out the emails and for more information, hope, God willing, at the, looking at the end of January to, to spearhead this. I wanna thank uh, Catherine Isaacs, the vice chair and women's officer who brought hope to HTSS. And of course, to our community director, Edward Howard, working behind the scenes to make it all logistically happen. We will now conclude the evening with a song of hope, Hatikva, with Chazan Avrami. Have a good evening and Chanukah Sameach. Thank you, Rabbanit. Before you go, just want to thank you for joining, Professor. It was enlightening uh, having uh, spoken to you this evening. Uh, you answered all my questions. I was so ready to give you a hard time, but you answered everything beautifully. And, uh, you know, my last question you answered even without me asking, and that is, you know, what does the workshop mean to the average person who doesn't come into contact with people who need hope and need love and need inspiration and need empathy? Um, but as you say, it's, uh, it's for every single person to grow because we all come in contact on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with people that need need love and need inspiration and need that hope. So I thank you for, as you call it, your Hanukkah gift to us. It's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you to you, to your wife, to your whole team, to everyone in the background, to Edward, to Catherine, to Madeline, to everyone who's helped this, uh, this uh, evening come true. And uh, I look forward to growing with the uh, with the uh, um, the uh, organization and uh, looking forward to an enhanced relationship and an ongoing relationship not just between you and myself but uh, between the whole community uh, and yours i'm not going to stand as i normally do for the hatikva because otherwise i'll be out of the camera hopefully dovi will be playing for me now here it goes join in hatikva the song of hope Kalon Baleva Penima Nefesh Yehudi Omiya Ulefate Mizrach Kadima Ayin Elensiyon so Sion Virushalayim 
Chanukah Sameach, a very happy Chanukah to everyone.